Good morning. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Asian Plan 2019. Um, thank you all for making some of you very long trips. Uh, it's, uh, you are a sight for sore eyes. Um, uh, this is uh, already, I think, the ninth, eighth or ninth iteration. And some of you are repeat offenders uh, who keep coming back. And thank you so much for. Uh, staying with us and uh, continuing this uh, conversation um, with us. Um, this year, uh, we, we chose a uh, theme, uh, Korea's Choice, and uh, um, we'll do a couple of things different this time than usual. I usually give a very short introduction, and uh, I, we have Jim Steinberg who's going to give a, a talk, but I, I'd also like to sort of frame this, uh, this conference a little bit more than I, than I uh, usually do. So just bear with me for, for a couple of minutes and on basically trying to explain why we, we chose this particular topic. Uh, uh, and because a lot of you know, we always have a topic, but then until, until this time, we had a pretty broad topic like the illiberal international order or the, or the new world disorder. But this time, we, we decided to focus on Korea. So as you know, Korea's choice. I think the reason for doing this is because we feel that you know history, geopolitics, um, everything, the recent change in, in, in the international order is forcing Korea to make some really fundamental choices um, in terms of values, in terms of norms, uh, in terms of security architecture, uh, trade regime, um, and just policy directions. Um, and, and being forced to make a choice is not necessarily a, a good thing. As we try to show in, in the film, um, uh, South Korea chose from the very beginning. We, we chose democracy, and we tro chose free market economy. And I think that choice has led to this remarkable prosperity and freedom that we enjoy today. I, I don't think there's any doubt. And you know, as, as also the, the, the film tried to show, uh, you know, there, there were limitations and some of the, you know, we, we weren't perfect in the, in the way we practice democracy or, or the free market economy and certainly there's much room for improvement and maybe, maybe even room for reform. But I think the direction had, had already been set right from, from the very beginning. And so whatever improvements, whatever reforms that we want to do, um, um, this is to, to perfect the choice uh, that, that we made to improve liberal democracy and free market economy. And of course, sustaining liberal democracy and free market economy can't do it without the liberal international order. And I think it was our alliance with the United States that, that gave us the kind of confidence in our security, which then enabled us to go headlong in, into economic development. And that's probably the, true with a lot of other countries in this, in this region and, and the rest of the world. So it's, it's really uh, thanks to this uh, open, multilateral, global tr trading order that Korea was able to achieve the so-called miracle on the Han. I think the, the, the challenge that we face today, the choice, why we're uh, being forced to make choices is because I think it's the liberal international order with its uh, openness, interdependence, multilateralism, that is being challenged is sort of under siege from all sides. United States, the architect of this global order, and EU, the best, best practitioner of this order, um, are having serious doubts about, about the very order that they represent and, and, and they embody. US is increasingly calling for America first as the principle to guide its security, as well as economic policies. The EU seems to be in danger of disintegration China has been one of the greatest beneficiaries, like South Korea, of the liberal international order ever since it adopted the open and reform policy in the 19, late 1970s. However, in recent years, China has been displaying what many describe as increasingly revisionist or even hegemonic tendencies regarding the very global order from which it has benefited. In its own way, is China too calling for a China first policy? North Korea's Chuche ideology, I think, is the very antithesis of the liberal international order. 
um, using its nuclear weapons as leverage. It is trying to undermine the very security structure in and around the Korean Peninsula that has brought all of us in this region freedom and prosperity, not just for South Korea. So it is becoming really increasingly difficult for South Korea to make the right policy choice in the face of this breakdown of the liberal international order. Um, and with an ally that, it, with a, that seems to have a different orientation than the one that we, we used to, we are used to. Um, also, we in South Korea, we're suffering from an inability to come up with a domestic consensus on the direction in which we need to go. Increasing rivalry and friction between the United States and China, and of course the complex dynamics surrounding the effort to denuclearize North Korea. Now, I, we posed the question Korea's choice, but of course the answer is obvious, right from the beginning, right? Korea's choice is clear. The moment we abandon the liberal democracy, free market economy, or the liberal international order, our freedom and prosperity will come to an end. So our challenge is how, how we can apply the principles of liberal democracy, free market economy, and the liberal international order to the, to the real concrete policy issues that we confront every day. Inter-Korean relations, ROK-US relations, ROK-China relations, ROK-Japan relations, our trade policies. I really hope that the conversation over the next two days will enable us to help us better articulate the choice that, that we face and really give us a clear sense of the direction in which we need to go. Um, in order to continue uh, to secure the freedom uh, and, and prosperity. As, uh, as the founder of, uh, of, the, of our institute and, and our chairman, Dr. M.J. Chung, always emphasizes the, the fact that in, in this you know, very far eastern tip, on this far eastern tip of this great Eurasian continent, that there is this liberal democracy and free market economy is, is a miracle in itself. And how do we sustain that miracle? I think that seems, that is the, the, the big challenge. And so, again, uh, we chose this topic because we want all your wisdom um, and, uh, and we really want to talk about what it is that, that we need to choose. What are, what are the choices that we face and what are the fundamental choices we need to make as we, we go forward. Now let me uh, introduce to you our, our keynote speaker, um, uh, Jim Steinberg. Uh, I talked about repeat offenders. We were just talking and Jim, you, this is your sixth participation uh, in, our, in our plenum. We're, we're uh, really, really grateful. Um, uh, Dr. Steinberg was Deputy National Security Advisor to President Clinton. Uh, he had this, of course, all of you know, this uh, uh, incredible career both in the academia and, and, and in public service uh, in, in the government. He was Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy Studies at Brookings. He was a Dean of the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas. He was Deputy Secretary of State uh, uh, from 2009 to 2011 and uh, he was the, served as dean of the Maxwell School uh, at, at Syracuse University, and c currently he is the professor of social science, international affairs, and law at Syracuse University. And we thought we couldn't find a better person to address this particular topic and help us uh, launch two days of conference. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Jim Steinberg. Well, thank you, Chai Bong and Chairman Chung, MJ, distinguished friends and colleagues. Uh, I'm really honored and, and grateful for the opportunity of addressing the uh, opening plenary of this year's Asan Plenum. Um, it's always been a great privilege to me to come to Seoul for these meetings, as uh, Chai Bong and I were talking about. Um, over the past decade, I really believe that the Asan Plenum has become 
the go-to place for discussions among security, political, and economic experts and, and, and uh, practitioners about the key issues that are facing this country and the region. And I always come back from these meetings with a much richer understanding and appreciation of the unfolding events that are taking place here. And so I especially look forward to our conversations over the next couple of days. Uh, Chai Bong has uh, outlined to you the, the theme of the conference, the idea of Korea's choice. And it is a fitting topic for a number of, of really uh, compelling reasons. To begin with, as you saw uh, in this wonderful video, and it's always one of the highlights of coming here, is to see this magnificent work that you do. It puts us all to shame. Um, uh, is to celebrate the choices that South Korea has made over its history, but especially um, since uh, over the last 30 years, uh, beginning in the 1980s when Korea made the key choice not just to be a democracy in words, but democracy in deed and practice, uh, empowering your citizens to take charge of their own destiny and charting their own future, and equally important to what you've done for your own people in Korea, to demonstrate to the rest of the world that democracy is the right choice of people everywhere irrespective of their previous political history, their ethnic or religious background or geography. The vibrancy and resilience of the democracy you've built here in Korea deserves to be celebrated, and it was done so nicely here. As Chai Bong showed, South Korea has also chose to build an economic model which has transformed this country into one of the great economic and technological powerhouses of our time, bringing millions out of poverty and great opportunity and hope to all the people of this country. And while you still face important choices on your economic future, and I will talk about that a bit in my remarks today, uh, this achievement too deserves, as we've seen, to be celebrated. You've also made the choice to be a contributor to global peace and prosperity through your contributions to development assistance, peacekeeping, and building global and regional multilateral institutions. You've transformed Korea from a country that looked to others for assistance to one that generously provides it to others, creating much needed public goods in a time when the questions arise about the value of those public goods. All of these choices have served the interests of the people of South Korea, but also of the region and the world. But in today's dynamic uh, environment, as uh, Chai Bong said in his opening remarks, Korea faces a number of new choices, each of which will prove as consequential as the choices that you've made in the past. And this morning, I want to discuss four choices facing Korea and the implication of those choices, not just for Korea, but for all of us gathered here today. And in making these remarks, I want to pay tribute to the many here who have contributed to our collective understanding of the challenges and opportunities facing South Korea as we enter the third decade of the 21st century. I want to give a special shout out to Scott Snyder for his indispensable book, South Korea at the Crossroads, and to Chai Bong for his remarkable and insightful article, Keeping Northeast Asia Abnormal, both of which I should say are required reading for my graduate students in my course on East Asia. The first choice, and it's a familiar one from the meetings we've had here over the years, is what to do about North Korea. Since we last met, we have witnessed the spectacle, I suppose I should say, of the two meetings between the United States and the DPRK, between President uh, Trump and Kim Jong-un, including the inconclusive, and I won't use the word failed, summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. We all know the important role that President Moon has played in facilitating the two meetings between the US and the DPRK, and the hopes, as well as the fears, that these two summits have engendered here in Korea and around the region. I needn't tell this audience that the North Korea issue is a multi-dimensional one, and though all the countries in the region share a desire to see an end to North Korea's nuclear program, there's much more at stake here, not just for the two Koreas, but for Japan, China, Russia, and of course the United States. And it's stating the obvious that the interests of the key actors here are not fully aligned. The development of North Korea's nuclear, and especially its long-range missile program, has created a new sense of urgency in Washington to address this problem. At the same time, it's complicated North Korea's, South Korea's choice about how to proceed. No country has a greater stake in reducing tensions on the Korean Peninsula and bringing a modicum of hope to the people of North Korea for a better life. For this reason, President Moon's efforts to reach across the DMZ are both understandable and welcome. 
At the same time, there is a critical need to assure that any arrangement with North Korea contributes to the long-term peace and stability of Northeast Asia. While immediate denuclearization of North Korea is highly unlikely in the foreseeable future, South Korea's leaders must, and I believe they do, recognize that ultimate denuclearization must remain the core objective. Similarly, while reducing inter-Korean tensions is critical, it's important to keep in mind that the stabilizing role that the U.S. ROK security ties have brought over the years, and that maintaining those ties means that the alliance must be more than a paper commitment. It must remain militarily credible. So South Korea's first choice is how to maintain the momentum for reduced tensions on the Korean Peninsula without sweeping under the carpet the dangers posed by North Korea's nuclear programs and its brutally repressive regime. Or to be brought about by sacrificing the benefits from strong U.S.-South Korean ties. Of course, your ability to meet this challenge also depends on the U.S. doing its part. Washington must recognize that it too benefits from the alliance and that policies that either end-run South Korea or pursue short-run burden-sharing gains at the expense of mutual respect ultimately harm the United States itself. The second choice that South Korea must make concerns its relationship with Japan. As someone who has worked over several decades in and out of government to help foster constructive ties between your two countries, I know that the issues are complex and deeply felt on both sides. And there is ultimately a limit to what third parties can do to help foster reconciliation and cooperation. Yet I would be less than candid if I didn't express a degree of sadness that despite some valuable initiatives on both sides, the relationship remains deeply troubled. Having written a bit about the importance of history in this region, I'm not simply one to counsel you to get over it. We know that from conflicts in other regions, the coming to grips with historic injustice is critical to moving forward. I also recognize that some of the difficulties in the relationship stem from more contemporary disputes and that these issues have a powerful hold on domestic politics. At the same time, it is vital not to lose sight of the enormous stakes both, that both Japan and South Korea have in working together. As the two leading industrial democracies of East Asia, cooperation between your two countries is critical to your own security and prosperity and to the long-term stability of the region as a whole. Korea's choice is to find a way to respect the legitimate concerns of your citizens with respect both to history and the modern disagreements, while recognizing that what should bring your two countries together counsels both a willingness to explore creative new approaches and, in the meantime, should try to limit the impact of those disagreements on your vital areas of cooperation. This is particularly important in light of the third choice that South Korea faces, how to position South Korea in the face of growing tensions and the emerging rivalry between the United States and China. As someone who has also worked to try to foster constructive U.S.-China ties for 25 years, it is with a sense of dismay and foreboding that I see the direction that this relationship is coming to take. Ten years ago, after President Obama took, his, took office and made his first trip to China, the two sides concluded the meeting with the following statement, and I quote, the two countries believe that to nurture and deepen bilateral strategic trust is essential to U.S.-China relations in the new era. During their discussions, the Chinese side said that it resolutely follows the path of peaceful development and a win-win strategy of opening up and is committed to promoting the building of a harmonious world of enduring peace and common prosperity. The United States reiterated that it welcomes a strong, prosperous, and successful China that plays a greater role in world affairs. China welcomes the United States as an Asia-Pacific nation that contributes to peace, stability, and prosperity in the region. The two sides reiterated that they are committed to building a positive, cooperative, and comprehensive U.S.-China relationship for the 21st century, and will take concrete actions to steadily build a partnership to address common challenges. That's the end of that statement from 2009. Today, the situation is very different. All right. okay. and 
missing a page here. Um, but the quotes that we know from the, um, the uh, national security strategy of the, of the United States is issued under the Trump administration has pointed to the many dangers that China poses and the threats that it poses to the United States and to the region. And it summarized the, uh, its overall approach to national security strategy uh, in the region by saying that China, along with Russia, challenges American power, influence, and interests, attempting to erode American security and prosperity, a harsh indictment that leaves little room for cooperation or even coexistence. I don't have the time to examine this morning how and why this dramatic change came to pass. My current own book project will look at the evolution of the relationship and what went wrong. So maybe next year, if you invite me back, I'll have more to say on this. What I do want to do now is focus on the implications of this development for the ROK. A binary zero-sum conflict between the United States and China poses some very stark choices for South Korea. Although many commentators have adopted the term competition to soften the conflictual dimension of the emerging rivalry, sports fans, and Jeremy, I know you know, that in a competition, each side each of the competitors expects that the spectators will take sides. South Korea, of course, could choose to side with the United States, recreating the Cold War alignment against China. But this would come with obvious costs and risks for Korea, given the magnitude of sino korea trade and investment ties and Korea's geographic proximity to China. China has demonstrated that it's prepared to wield its economic clout against countries that cross it, as we have seen in the case of the dispute over THAAD. And if Korea places all its eggs in the US basket, and you'll excuse the Easter metaphor, uh, can Korea really count on the United States to protect the nest if push comes to shove in a confrontation with China? The Trump administration's prevarication on the values of the alliance should give some pause to that choice for Korea. Alternatively, of course, South Korea could bandwagon with China and hope that a friendly attitude towards the rising near power at hand would be reciprocated with generosity. But in a region where history looms large, the specter of a tributary state relationship with China is certain to give pause. Although China likes to tout the benign ways of the Ming Dynasty under Admiral Zheng He as in harbinger of how it would treat its neighbors under a Pax Sinica, the neighbors are rightly wary, to say the least. And public opinion here in Korea is rightly worried about too great a dependence on China. Of course, South Korea could seek to stay neutral and remain in good favor with both sides. But here, too, history is a caution. President Trump is not the first president to suggest that either you are with us or against us. And if there are any other fellow Texans here in the audience, I see Karen here, so she'll appreciate this. We in Texas uh, have a saying that the only thing in the middle of the road is a dead armadillo. The recent disputes between the United States and our allies over the adoption of China's telecom technology is a harbinger of the growing either-or nature of the U.S.-China competition. Korea, of course, might try to buttress this course of independence by trying to strengthen your own capacity for defense. I know that there continues to be a vigorous debate here about whether, in light of the uncertainty about the U.S. commitment and anxiety about China's increasing assertiveness, China should consider developing its own nuclear capability. But despite the arguments of some of my IR theory friends, and John Eikenberry is not one of those in this camp, more nuclear weapons in East Asia is not likely to produce more security for anyone and increases the risks of accidents or unintended escalation in a crisis. In his essay, Chai Bong points out uh, rightly the false seduction of this idea of a normal balance of power solution to the 20th century security problems of East Asia. Finally, Korea might choose to make common cause with other countries that fear being caught in the middle between the United States and China. Most of Korea's regional neighbors share the fear about a growing U.S.-China tensions and want to maintain good ties with each. 
a goal which might be more feasible if countries like Korea, Japan, Australia, Indonesia, and India could work together as a third force. But the Cold War itself is a cautionary tale about the ability of the non-aligned to thrive when the elephants fight. To my mind, then, the best choice for South Korea is to help mitigate and even reverse this growing and dangerous confrontation between the United States and China, and thus avoid the various Hobson's choices I've just outlined above. To do this, South Korea must leverage its relationship with both China and the United States. Vis-a-vis -vis China, South Korea must make clear that bullying and intimidation will be met with resistance and resolve. And similarly, in the spirit of our longstanding friendship, Korean leaders must encourage the United States to keep open the path to constructive cooperation with China, so long as China lives up to its rhetorical commitments to respect the sovereignty and independence of its neighbors and uphold the international rule of law. There's a fourth and final choice related to the one I've just discussed, a choice which concerns the future of the Korean economy. Korea's economic miracle has depended heavily on the triumph of globalization and economic interdependence. Exports represent more than 40% of Korea's GDP. But this process, as Chai Bong said, has come uh, under attack from all sides, from a China that seems ambivalent at best about open markets, pursues protectionist and mercantile economic policies, and restricts access to China's own vast market. Now, too, the United States seems to be moving along a similar path, eschewing multilateral trade openings in favor of more protectionist policies and bilateral trade deals that seek to build on the U.S. asymmetric clout. There is increasing talk in both China and the United States about decoupling our two economies. China seeks to promote what it calls indigenous innovation by excluding foreign companies, subsidizing its own firms on the global stage, and resorting to the illegal expropriation of foreign technology and intellectual property. The U.S., in turn, while rightly concerned about protecting U.S. technology and security interests, is increasingly turning to broad brush exclusion of China from the U.S. economy, imposing new restrictions on investments in the United States, on people-to-people -people exchange, and unilateral trade measures that undermine the WTO and the global open trade regime. South Korea has much to lose from this turn away from open markets and free exchange. As a beneficiary of globalization, Korea must now become its champion. This means standing up for multilateral trade and investment on the international stage and by pushing forward the process of reform here at home to better embody the values of competition, transparency, and open trade to foster competition, innovation, entrepreneurship, greater opportunities for women and youth, and to address the problems of endemic corruption. These, then, are four key choices for South Korea. But before I conclude, I'd like to say a word about China's choice and about the United States' choice. As I noted earlier, relations between our two countries have changed dramatically over the past decade. More and more influential voices on both sides of the Pacific have come to see the relationship in zero-sum terms. Although the U.S. public is perhaps less pessimistic than the blob, public sentiments, too, have become more wary. It's fashionable in some circles to see this as an inevitable result of conflict between a dominant and rising power. While such parsimonious explanations have a cachet in academia, this recourse to structural inevitability too easily lets policymakers off the hook. There's little doubt that changes in the economic and military distribution of power pose enormous challenges to international stability. And that challenge is compounded by the stark differences in philosophy of governance between our two countries. I share the widespread concern over recent China's, Chinese actions at home and abroad that appear to threaten the legitimate economic and security interests of others, actions that I need not catalog to this audience at length. But it is the height of irresponsibility simply to shrug our shoulders in the face of these difficulties and resign ourselves to an increasingly conflictual relationship. As Shakespeare wisely noted, and I quote, men are sometimes the masters of their fates. The fault is not in the stars, but in ourselves, if we resign ourselves to this dismal and dangerous future. The quote that Chaibon gave from Churchill reflects a similar sentiment. We can sugarcoat the danger 
that the relationship uh, will turn in this direction by calling our strategies, quote, competitive. It has a soothing ring, just as we see as economic competition as a system that generates benefits for all, or we extol the virtues of Schumpeterian destruction. But recall the Oxford Dictionary definition of competition, and I quote, the activity or condition of striving to gain or win something by defeating or establishing superiority over others. Competition in international relations is not like kindergarten soccer. There are winners and losers, and neither side will easily or graciously accept losing. We can console ourselves by pointing to the end of the Cold War when the United States and our allies peacefully prevailed over the Soviet Union. But we should never forget how many times during that twilight struggle the two sides brought the world to the brink of calamity. I believe it is still not too late to change the direction of our relationship. But this will require some hard choices by the leaders of our two countries. For China, this means a fundamental and credible commitment to re reassuring its neighbors um, the, and the world that China's rise will not come at the expense of the security and prosperity of others. As I've written elsewhere, it is the special responsibility of the rising power to provide this reassurance especially given how much China itself has benefited from the U.S.-led order over the past decades. But for the United States, it means a recognition that China, too, like any country, is entitled to a reasonable degree of security and a voice in the management of global affairs. As hard as these choices may now seem, we owe it to our people and to peoples everywhere to make the right ones. I believe it is not too late. Thanks again for the privilege of talking to you today, and I look forward to our discussions in the days to come. Thank you. Happy to take questions, comments. I don't know if we have microphones or not, but uh, I think we can all hear each other. Anybody? Hard for me to see out there. Yep, please. I don't know if they have, do we have, yes, we have microphones. Hi, my name is Yoichi Kato, nice hey, to see you. You said the best, voice for, best, best choice for Korea is mitigate confrontation between United States and China. I think it's easy to say and hard to do. And uh, can you give us, enlighten us, what's uh, one of the perhaps a specific way to implement that, thank you. As I suggested, but in shorthand, I think there are two dimensions to this. I think um, the first uh, is, is the message that Korea has to give to China, which is to demonstrate um, that however powerful China is, uh, however strong the attraction is of the Chinese economy, that Korea has some red lines that it will defend and protect. I think the dispute over THAAD was an important example of, of why that, both the nature of the challenge and the importance of the, the South Korean response, that, um, that China cannot be allowed to believe that its ability to intimidate and use its market and its economy as a way to uh, coerce acquiescence by its neighbors will be effective. There are costs, and, and South Korea and South Korean companies and people paid the price for the uh, intimidation that China sought to impose after the FAD decision. But Korea stood up. And I think it has to be very clear that, uh, that there is a determination not to let these tactics uh, be effective. But at the same time, I think that Korea needs to make clear to the United States that it does not welcome this either-or game, and that it will not be seduced into the idea that you have to pick sides, and that the Korea will stand firm in terms of the security relationship with the United States, but the price of that relationship can't be a decision to somehow become part of a new grand containment strategy against China, and that South Korea has to say that that can't be a contingency or a condition of the relationship between the United States and South Korea. I think it's a message that South Korea has to give. It's not just South Korea. I think all of our allies need to make clear that they continue to believe in the value of security and political and economic ties to the United States, but that they do not wish to be drawn into a new block-to-block -block confrontation. And I think that, that the voice of countries like South Korea and the strong commitments and our shared values do resonate 
in Washington. Even though there are some questions about how the current administration sees it, I think if you look to the broader political debate in Washington, there is an appreciation about uh, taking it into account and respect the views of our allies. And so it's important that when uh, Korean leaders or Japanese leaders or Australian leaders come to Washington, that they make clear to the United States that as much as they value the friendship and alliance, that they don't think that this is a welcome development and they don't want to see a recreation of this Cold War division of the world. Phil. Um, I wonder whether uh, the allies of the United States should also um, demonstrate uh, to the United States that there are some red lines. And I'm thinking today of the news that uh, the Iranian oil embargo is going to be extended, all the exemptions are going to be <coughs> removed. So allies of the US will be punished for buying any Iranian oil. This despite the fact that there is an international agreement with Iran, signed by the US at the time, endorsed by the United Nations, which the U United States has unilaterally withdrawn from. Now, should countries like South Korea, but also my own country, Britain, Germany, France, say, hey, no, this is a red line. We are going to get together and defy you on issues like this where you are so flagrantly uh, uh, unconcerned about international norms and the international rule of law. So it's a, it's a great question, and uh, I bear many scars from my many years in government. One of the scars I bear is a predecessor to this whole dispute from the 1990s, a piece of legislation called the Iran-Libya Sanctions Act, which will be familiar to a few of the older Americans in the crowd, uh, in which the United States, uh, in its desire and correct desire uh, to address our, our concerns about Iran and Libya in the 1990s, uh, not only imposed our own sanctions on um, doing business with the two countries, but also sought to impose what are called third-party sanctions on others to prevent them from doing business. Um, we appropriately can and should try to persuade other countries when we think there's a course of action uh, that makes sense. And if we think we, that, although I certainly disagree, that, that, that countries should not continue to respect the Iranian agreement, we should use our diplomatic and persuasive powers to do it. But when the United States starts punishing other countries and starts punishing allies when they disagree with us, uh, there's a cost. There's a cost in terms of mutual trust, but there's even a bigger cost because what happens when you do that, and the only reason these th secondary sanctions are effective is because of the importance of the U.S. economy to these other countries. They're faced with a choice of either doing business with the United States or doing business with Iran or in the earlier case with Libya. The problem is that works in the short term, but over time countries say, well, if the price of doing business in the United States is we become subject to the jurisdiction of the U.S. Congress, we're going to find other ways to do business. We're not going to clear transactions through New York. We're not going to put ourselves at risk of these kind of third-party sanctions. So it's very short-sighted of the United States, however justified our policies may be, to try to use these secondary sanctions and third-party sanctions to enforce our view of correct policy on others, and especially to do it vis-a-vis uh, -vis other countries. Uh, as I say, I don't agree. I think we should, uh, uh, as being part of the previous administration, think the deal was a good deal and we should respect it. But even if I agreed with the Trump administration that the deal was a mistake uh, and we should push for more pressure, we should do it by encouraging and trying to persuade our allies, not threatening, intimidating, punishing them, and bullying them. And I think we need to recognize um, whatever choices other countries make about recognizing these secondary sanctions and these attempts on our part to extend our jurisdiction, that they may work to some degree in the short term, as they seem to be doing. But they, we pay a huge price in the long term for doing it. And our long term interest is, is whatever the virtue of our policy is to use our power of persuasion and our, our, the conviction about the rightness of the course rather than the uh, leverage of our economy and, and the threat of these kinds of sanctions to get our way. Karen. Right in front. Uh, you said that um, denuclearization has to remain the key goal. How does South Korea now given its desire to continue to improve relations with the North, do so without undermining 
denuclearization when so far there's no progress on that? I mean, what's your advice on navigating that contradiction? I think the key is to make clear that um, ultimately the attempt to try to reduce tensions in the, in the peninsula without addressing the nuclear program will, will not succeed. That, that it, it seems somehow that perhaps you can try to warm the relationship, build more trust, and that over time uh, the, the nuclear program will go away. But there's a danger that actually what it does is it just it basically takes the, the nuclear program off the table and North Korea gets the benefits of an improved relationship without having to sacrifice anything in its nuclear program. I think the key, and we have a lot of experts here, and I'm sure we'll discuss it at more length, is to recognize that first this is not going to happen overnight. Um, that we need to figure out a set of steps that will allow progress to be made uh, while keeping the nuclear issue uh, front and center and not to expect it all to happen uh, at once or even in a very short period of time. Uh, there was a lot that's on the table now, potentially on the table, that would limit the ability of North Korea in the first instance to expand its program, but also to create the, a, a set of iterated steps that uh, would lead to more progress. We've seen this in earlier times, including some of the, the roadmaps that were laid up during the Bush administration and their negotiations during the six-party talks. And so we need to be pragmatic about how this is going to happen, but we also have to be confident enough to, or convinced enough to believe that we can't simply allow the idea of improved relationships to solve the problem itself, and that it needs to be, for a variety of reasons, uh, part of the moving forward, and that the North needs to understand that, that, it, that it's just simply not possible to move forward with normalization, improved and reduced tensions at a time when these, these debt, the North Korea is unwilling to address this fundamental source of instability. Yes. Thank nice you. to see you. Uh, thank you for your uh, keynote speech. My question is, uh, concerns China-American relations. I think you are still cautiously optimistic, optimistic about this relationship, seeing that we are not too late to save it. Um, my question is that we, our two countries are in a trade war. Uh, we, our uh, warships are confronting each other in the South China Sea, and uh, also the. Uh, conflict seems to be getting geographical, uh, uh, geostrategic. And also, the, I, I think the worst thing is people-to-people -people relations are suffering. Uh, in the recent cases that the, of visa denials to the uh, academics, in, uh, especially on the Chinese side, that many dozens of Chinese scholars have been denied or revoked visas to the United States. And in addition to that, hundreds of Chinese students who are studying in the United States has been de delayed visa insurance for months. So they cannot finish their college in time, and they have to wait for six to eight months to get their H1, uh, F1 visa. So this kind of uh, I mean, the, the, the disruption of people-to-people -people relation, which is the foundation for improvement of our relations, are getting worse. So what, 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 what would be your comment? And what are the factors that make you still cautiously optimistic? Thank you. Well, I, I, it's, it's a low bar to optimism if you say that the optimism comes because I think it's not too late. Um, uh, because I'm not optimistic, and I hope my remarks indicated to you why I'm quite pessimistic about the direction uh, that this is going and, and the need for bold and, and clear action. Um, for many years, I was on the board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist, and we have this thing called the Doomsday Clock, uh, which sort of measures how close we are to calamity. Um, and the bad news is we we're always within a few minutes of midnight, but the, the good news is we never got to midnight, and that's where I think we are. We are in a few minutes to midnight in this relationship. And so when I say not too late, I simply mean that I, I have not given up. And frankly, as somebody who's been involved in policy, however dire situations our policymakers are congenitally given to sort of trying still 
to make it work. So I don't want to give any false impression of, of Pollyannish expectation that somehow it's all going to work out. Left to its own in the direction we're going, it is not going to work out. That's my strong message to you. And I do think that we need appreciation on both sides about the risks that we're running. Um, on the specifics, you know, um, I think first it's important to recognize that China also uh, is uh, not exactly free about uh, who it allows and doesn't allow to have visas to come to the country. And critics of China are denied visas uh, regularly to, to come to China. And we have a lot of our journalist friends who've had to deal with this as well as some American scholars. So both sides need to look at this. Nonetheless, I share the concern. I think that it's r really somewhat disturbing to me of a country that prides itself on freedom and openness that we should be afraid of having these people come. I have no doubt that some uh, individuals who come to the country from China and elsewhere have objectives to benefit their country and may have ulterior motives. But we shouldn't be afraid of that. I mean, there are ways to take care of it. There are restrictions that we can impose. But I, for one, think it's, it's a, a sign of weakness rather than strength to be too cautious about who we let come. Um, and I am certainly concerned about uh, the danger to exchanges, there'll be a tit-for-tat reaction. And I know for all of us who value the amount of time that we go to China, and I go to China regularly, as you know, um, you know, I would be sorry to see it. We will all lose by having a, a loss of these kinds of exchanges. Um, I think we have to have our eyes open about the way in which some academic institutions and institutions in China are connected to the state, just as we have to have our eyes open by the way companies like Huawei have connections to the state. We shouldn't pretend they don't exist, but there are ways to deal with this other than some of the broad brush methods that we're seeing now. And I think it, it isn't in our, shouldn't be in our DNI to, to have this kind of uh, unwillingness to, to find a better way to deal with these challenges. So um, uh, I, I, don't want to, I don't think China should be let off the hook in this respect, but we should be better than this. And I hope that, uh, that some of us in, in our attempts to, to make clear why we benefit from this, and this is not just somehow a benefit only for China to have these exchanges. I have a lot of Chinese students in my classes. I value them. I think we learn a lot. I hope they learn a lot from the experience of being in the open debate that uh, we have in our classrooms uh, here in the United States. Okay, one last question. Let's go in the, well, wherever you guys want to go. I see a hand over there if you want to. Is that Evans? Okay, see who's there. Thank you. Uh, Chai Bong said that the EU is the best practitioner of the international liberal order. I, I of course, agree uh, with, <laughs> with that. And uh, we are not at the danger of disintegration, by the way. Uh, <laughs> But I would like to make... I was wondering if somebody was going to take him on. <laughs> I just would like to take, another flow, uh, take up another issue. Uh, Korea's choice. Well, one choice would be, and I have spent some time and effort with, with my colleagues to explain that to our Korean friends, to take the route of multilateralism and the rule of law. It is the case which was mentioned, the Iran case. It's the case of the WTO. It's the case of, of the Ukraine. There are many issues which you have to take up long term. And there, I agree completely with you, we have this hope of long term, but the damage short term uh, or the advantages gained short term, I think should not close, we should not close the eyes for the long term perspectives. And I think therefore Korea's choice, there is uh, something to do together with the European Union in that respect, in this very principled aspect. And to be more practical, if you want to diversify, if you want to make sure that you don't depend on one partner too much, well, you can work perhaps more with your third largest trading partner and with the biggest investor in Korea, which happens to be the European Union. Well, I, I agree with uh, those sentiments exactly. As I said, I do think that, that Korea, because it has been the beneficiary of globalization and the liberal international order, needs to be its champion, needs to be unafraid, including to take on the United States when we see the present administration trying to destroy the WTO, to make clear why that's damaging for everybody and that, that Korea, as much as it values the relationship with the United States, is not going to be a party to that. I think you know efforts to sustain multilateral trade in this region are extremely important. Uh, I applaud the TPP-11 for going forward, notwithstanding our unwillingness to be part of that. I think we need to find other ways uh, to make this happening. I've uh, got a, an exercise in my graduate seminar right now as we speak 
I ask my students to come up with strategies for East Asian countries to sustain multilateralism in the face of the U.S. Uh, unwillingness to go on and what might work. So maybe I'll learn a little bit more when I get back to class uh, uh, next week about their thoughts about uh, how to do this. I do think, and I think the EU can be a, a very valuable partner, but I do think that what's critical here is, and it is a continued challenge for the EU given its own uh, uh, difficulties, is to be activist in this front as well. And to, and to, despite the divisions within the EU on some of these issues, just stand up for these basic principles and to be uh, a force on the global stage. I think that the EU potentially is an important part of this dynamic that can stand up in the face of choices by both China and the United States to move away from this. But we also see in, in parts of the EU also movements that uh, don't seem to fully embrace these liberal principles. So uh, I would welcome uh, a far more active role by the EU for all the reasons that uh, you suggested. Well, great questions. Thank you all. I really look forward to the discussions, and thank you for having me.